Welcome, everyone. Woo. Woo. Yeah, that's what I like to hear. The lights are going down. The music has, did you like the jazz? <laughs> um, welcome to the third annual Mount SAC Students, Mount SAC President Student Sustainability Awards Ceremony. Um, I hope everyone here is enjoying the beautiful weather today and had an enjoyable Earth Day. Every day is Earth Day in my book, and there are activities happening, happening around campus for Earth Week. Uh, you might have noticed the chalk art that was uh, put up, I think, by the Eagle Club that was around the library and Student Life and I think a couple other places, a big giant blue whale. It was, it was uh, quite impressive. I was pretty impressed when I walked in on uh, Monday and saw all of that. Um, there's also been the eco pop-ups. I know there were a couple today when I was walking over here. Um, there are sustainability tours planned. Um, and we have a guest, Christopher Nergis, who's going to be here today on campus at 145 at the Wildlife Sanctuary um, uh, Theater or whatever uh, auditorium there. What do you call it? Amphitheater, Amphitheater that's the word. Um, so. I'm sure all of you um, are aware of these things, of Earth Day and things like that. Finding ways to participate on campus, of course, is ideal. And I hope you all had, have a chance to do some of those things this week. Um, including this event afterwards will be um, uh, the annual Earth Day lecture uh, with Jonathan Rin. My name is Jared Burton, and I'm a librarian here at Mount SAC. And with the honor of coordinating the Mount SAC President's Student Sustainability Awards. The award started as an initiative by College President Dr. William Scroggins in 2015, and the first ceremony was held in spring of 2016. Uh, Dr. Scroggins is a strong supporter of campus sustainability, and we are very fortunate to have these awards to recognize the work of Mount Sac students in their efforts to envision a sustainable future. Let's all give a round of applause to show our gratitude for Dr. Scroggins and the fact that we have this opportunity to shine a light on the students. <laughs> According to the purpose statement, uh, the Mount Sac President's Student Sustainability Awards are intended to encourage Mount Sac students to engage in the study and exploration of topics related to sustainability, leading to the development of solutions to environmental and interrelated social problems confronting Mount, Sac, Mount San Antonio College and the larger society. So as we will see, the awarded work can address not only environmental issues facing campus or society, but also the interrelated social problems that arise out of those issues. This gives the opportunity for students to really think broadly and, or specifically in terms of how to propose solutions that lead to a more sustainable world. So how is sustainability defined? According to the US, according to the US Environmental Protection Agency's website, still, Sustainability is based on a simple principle. Even that event, everything that we need for our survival and well-being depends either directly or indirectly on our natural environment. To pursue sustainability is to create and maintain the conditions under which humans and nature can exist in productive harmony to support present and future generations. Part of the sustainability movement is something known as regeneration. For example, Cal Poly Pomona, just over the hills to the east, has the Lyle Center for Regenerative, Regenerative Design, housed in the College for Environmental Design, and states on their webpage, titled, About Regeneration, Regenerative studies is a unique descriptor for the interdisciplinary field of inquiry concerned with a sustainable future. While closely aligned with environmental, economic, and social sustainability projects, regenerative studies places emphasis on the development of community support systems, which are capable of being restored, renewed, revitalized, or regenerated through the integration of natural processes, community action, and human behavior. 
It is argued that the development of regenerative systems is the most promising method for ensuring a sustainable future. Not merely conserving critical natural resources, but even enhancing them over time, end quote. I have provided a very general definition of regenerate, which is the root word of regeneration on the screen here. One, to establish on a new, to reestablish on a new, usually improved basis or make new or like new. Two, to bring, lead, or force to abandon a wrong way and adopt a right one. Three, to return to life or to get or give new life or energy. And four, to restore strength. In 2015, in a, prof in a professional development workshop with Professor Craig Peterson, who is, a wild, who is the director of the Wildlife Sanctuary here at Mount Sac, among many other things, he mentioned regeneration and challenged us to think about ways to incorporate the concept into our work in sustainability here on campus. As a result, I have attempted to do so today. Oftentimes, awards are treated simply as competitions, especially if there is a prize, like $500. Competitions themselves can create anxiety. Will I win? Or more often, will I lose? Today, I'd like to reduce some of that anxiety and bring to light the work of those who submitted to the Sustainability Awards who did not win, but nevertheless have made a concerted effort towards thinking about and working towards sustainability. We will acknowledge these students with certificates of regeneration, with the intention being to make the Sustainability Awards a strong support system that will continue to revitalize student work towards a sustainable future. I will first present the work of the students with a brief description, and at the end of presenting all the work, invite the students who are here to the stage, present them with their certificates of regeneration, and we'll take a photo. The first student is Alonso Armendariz. He was suggesting that we have sleeping pods on campus. I heard a yeah and a yes. <laughs> he took a survey of students, and 95% of the students supported this concept. Rest is important. Sleep is important when you're a student. So he is our first regenerative certificate winner. Marissa Caldera, a beautiful and provoking painting about the importance of personal and collective decision making for a better future. This art piece makes you think about how making a decision is critical to creating a sustainable future, whether it's minor, day to day, or in, bigger, um, in a bigger context. Her picture says, my painting, Decisions, Decisions, shows the two very different worlds we humans can have depending on the choices we make. Little decisions from day to day life or major life changing decisions all impact our world. Change needs to happen now. Every person is responsible. Anthony Gradias, he suggested creating the West Covina Community Garden. Um, you can see he wrote here in his essay, the difficulty lies not so much in developing new ideas and escaping is as in escaping from old ones, which is a quote from John Maynard Keynes. He says that accurately describes the way in which the world works today. I plan to share with you a solution that can contribute to a majority of our problems we face today on a global scale, such as pollution, world hunger, homelessness, and even poverty. So he goes on to talk about how community gardens are something that are um, a sustainable system, support system for uh, food, right, for people who maybe are uh, impoverished when, in food, who live in food deserts, but also as a way to bring people together and to work towards a common goal and enjoy gardening, which is a very healthy thing to do. Sandra Nunez. This is a very uh, unique 
uh, entry. What Sandra did was notice that there wasn't a crosswalk um, on campus that went from, that was nearby the, um, the Child Development Center. And so she circulated a petition to students, particularly students with, ch um, with children, to suggest a, a crosswalk be painted. And it worked. There is now a crosswalk there. Sandra Nunez also presented with Amanda Frausto I think, um, the issue of mothers on campus not having adequate resources to nursing rooms. So if they are breastfeeding, how are they supposed to go, how are they supposed to do that and be a student at the same time? And so they wrote an essay and a paper showing the need is very critical for that here on campus. And uh, working in the library, I see very often parents who are students with their children. And it is an important thing. We are all at different stages of our lives where we need certain support systems here on campus. And I think this was a very legitimate concern and a very, um, a very important suggestion to make. And finally, we have Phi Theta Kappa. They uh, hosted an event in 2018 fall called Make a Difference Day, and they volunteered at a place called Amy's Farm, which is a local farm that relies heavily on volunteers to maintain their fields. They felt it was a way to reach out to the community to help um, maintain their, their work, their agricultural work there, and that, uh, that work is very valuable when our students go out and help in the community. So if any of the students I have just named or the representatives could now please join me on the stage, I will present the certificates of regeneration and we'll take a photo. And please join me in a round of applause for all of them. I have at least one. Come on up. A couple more. Your Okay, thank you so much. Another round of applause. The Sustainability Awards has four categories. Artistic expression, discovery slash research, innovative idea, and student leadership. But there are five awards of $500 each, so four categories, five awards. Therefore, there have always been two awards in one category. This year, we, w we had nine judges from different departments score the work. Here are the names of the judges and their respective departments. Are any of the judges present at this time? If you are, could you please stand and let's have a round of applause for their work and dedication in selecting this year's Sustainability Awards. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. I am not a judge, I'm just the coordinator. Today I will present the awards to each of the winners briefly to descri and describe their work. Invite them to the stage, I think some were able to come. Present them with a certificate of excellence and we'll take a photo. So we're just gonna relax, no rush, right? Uh, before I announce the winner for each category, I will also very briefly mention the winners from the last two years. My hope is that this will give us all a sense of the scope of the awarded work over the last three years. The previous award winners are also documented on the Sustainability Awards webpage.
The first category recognized today is artistic expression. This category is open to a song, a poem, a short story, a painting, a photograph, a sculptor, screen print, short film, dance choreography, or any other form of artistic expression that represents sustainability or is connected to it and the social issues surrounding it. In 2017, Alice Tokunaga won for the sustainable dress design. In 2018, the Native American Intertribal Student Association won for a short film titled Hungry Ghosts Journey for Water. Here's the work of this year's winner, Ro Shin Lu. You can see the work deals directly with plastic straws and their impact on marine environments. So take a minute to look at that. According to Ro Shin Lu, he writes that in a 2017 study from researchers at the University of California, Santa Cruz, almost 91% of the plastic straws we use are not recycled properly and end up in landfills or the ocean. The main reason to eliminate the use of plastic straws is because it has a strong negative impact on our oceans and marine wildlife. Plastic straws are small and unnoticeable, and many people forget that they are plastic and do not recycle them. Therefore, these straws, which can't get through the mechanical recycling sorter anyway, since they are so small and lightweight, pollute recycled loads, lands, and get disposed as garbage. Thus, when these straws enter our oceans, they can harm our marine lives. Marine animals such as sea turtles and fishes can accidentally swallow and straw and get and choke and die from them. Therefore, this becomes my purpose to create my series of posters that addresses the issue of plastic straws. By using the graphic art to show the problem, I hope to make the audience see my posters, who see my posters, I hope that they can understand the issue easily and reject the use of single-use plastics like straws and create sustain a sustainable environment for ourselves and future generations. So, Roshan Lu, if you are here, will you please join me on stage? And let's have a round of applause for this, winner's, this year's winner in artistic expression. Thank you so much. Thank you. And we'll take a picture. Great. Thank you so much. Congratulations. Congratulations. The second category is discovery slash research. The name was originally research in 2016, and then we tried discovery in 2017. And this year, we are presenting it simply as discovery slash research. This category is for those who have written a research paper, developed a speech, given a presentation, developed an activity that's related to sustainability or connected to the social issues. In 2016, we had Eric Stubbs, who wrote about his experiment on the effect of frass production by styrofoam-fed mealworms on mung bean plants. <laughs> In 2017, we had uh, Phi Theta Kappa, who submitted a detailed bibliography on the fashion industry, titled Fashion Industry Environmental Impact. Here's a passage from this year's winner, Anika White, Anika Nicole White. She writes, the origin of your water bottle starts as polyethylene terra, I can't even say it, or more commonly PET, which is not a pet you wanna have around and take care of and pet, right? Uh, uh, PET, uh, which according to an article called How Plastic Bottles Are Manufactured, is a compound that is a thermoplastic polymer that can be either opaque or transparent, depending on the exact material composition. PET is deadly to humans. In many studies, it is linked to cancer and is often the cause of, of that bottle water taste associated with, with water companies. 
Whether it be Life Water, Dasani, or Aquafina, they all have that weird plastic taste. This is the taste of the plastic bottle student's water comes from, which is one of the most deadly carcinogens of our time. And it is in every single plastic product sold in the student's stores. Anika also writes, banning the single-use plastic water bottle would be the best step towards a more environmentally friendly and sustainable campus. The production of the water bottle causes pollution within the air, since crude oil must be purified to create bottles, and pollution in the form of litter, which is turn in turn, eventually will turn into marine and terrestrial contamination from improper disposal of plastic bottles. There are many alternatives to single-use plastic, as you will see in the essay, which I just read from, and in the long run will be cheaper and safer for the students and the campus. I can't read her entire uh, research paper right now. That wouldn't work, but uh, the judges chose her as the winner for the discovery research category. Anika, if you were here, will you please join me on stage? For a picture. Thank you. Great work. So the next category is innovative idea. So this, uh, this category had the most submissions this year and I think last year. So we can see our students are very innovative. They have a lot of ideas. And that's a wonderful thing. Um, it does make it harder for the judges, I think. <laughs> um, one of the judges this year suggested, can we just make it one prize of $2,500 and we just choose one? <laughs> so I said, I don't think Dr. Scroggins wants us to do that. But um, it's, it, uh, this is a, um, this is, uh, what was I going to say? The, um, 2017 winner for this is uh, the Cleaner Campus Initiative what, that was presented by the Eagle Club. In 2018, Kel Henderson won for her innovative idea that was proposed as the Mount Sac Upcycling Green Waste proposal. And then we had a second winner in 2018 who uh, it was the group, the Society of Physics Students, who designed a, a climate change detecting rocket and really did, and, and then used it and launched it and was able to have a sensor that um, was able to pick up particulate matter. So here's a, uh, a portion of the submission for this year's winner, Vic Chow. And this is a very, uh, I found this one very unique in that it's a proposal that's based on work done by Vic at Los Osos uh, High School. So as a high school student, he writes that um, when he found out about the breadth and depth of the problem in high school, I created an organization called eExchange whose goal was to collect e-waste from the surrounding community, fix all the electronics we could, and recycle the ones we couldn't, and distribute the electronics that we fixed to students in need. During our first collective drive, we were able to collect over 2,000 pounds of e-waste and were donated over, 30 com and donated over 30 computers and laptops after we cannibalized the computers to make them, make them usable ones. Um, we worked with the administration to create a process to distribute electronics to those in need. Vic then continues to write that the e-exchange at Los Osos High School is alive and well. However, I have further aspirations and modifications that I, uh, for what I consider to be a decent proof of concept. We ran into many roadblocks along the way and had to cut through lots of red tape in order to get the organization up and running. The next idea I have for e-exchange is to create a replicable model with infrastructure outside of the school to increase the level of autonomy we were able to operate with. So the idea here is that there was a seed of an idea that that grew uh, 
in the work done in high school and now wanting to take that model and use it to create a club here at Mount Sac that would do something very similar. And the proposal was that very um, model of setting up the club with the conditions that are required here at Mount Sac. So, Vic, if you are here, will you please join me on stage to have your uh, certificate and a round of applause? Thank you. So like last year, uh, we did have oops, we did have two um, winners for uh, innovative idea. Uh, this year's winner, presented by Rene Jimenez, was an idea called the uh, Club Carbon Commitment, referring to clubs here on campus. Uh, this very innovative idea was to motivate students to. Um, who are in clubs, who are club members, to actually, uh, in order to address the, um, the carbon that is emitted through uh, transportation here to campus, how, can they, how could carpooling be part of that solution? Because as a commuter college, that is one of our biggest impacts on the environment, is all of the cars that come here. We know because of the parking, right? That uh, there's a great deal of traffic and, and whatnot, and that contributes to the, um, the impact Mount Sac has. Uh, so this idea of carpooling and making it an incentive for clubs to carpool and to earn points um, was Renee's idea. And so I want to read his um, essay. The club carbon commitment is a carpooling commitment from the student clubs that encourages students belonging to the same club to commute together. The C3 model is a response to the rising local and global issues of climate change that can and can be easily replicated on other college campuses. According to Mount Sac's CO2 emissions inventory report, student commuting is the greatest producer of greenhouse gas at over 70%. With C3, the C3 has two goals: reduce the global uh, the GHG emissions and build student club cohesion. Reducing GHG emissions can be done by encouraging carpooling amongst clubs. Each year, student clubs vary in quantity and individual size, but two things are constant, the interclub council and the high number of active clubs on campus each year. Every semester, there are about 45 to 60 active clubs. This provides the C3 a base for communication and institutional longevity. Clubs that are committed to reducing GHG are awarded club of the year points or raffle tickets as incentives. Students that carpool to campus will receive one stamp on their C3 cards via the pay lot kiosk on San Jose Hills Road. The C3 card holds five stamp slots and will then be turned over to, to an interclub council officer once completed. For every C3 card completed, the club will receive one out of 10 possible points. Carpooling data can be collected off the number, C3 car, number of C3 cards, data tracking sheets, and participant surveys. Through continued dedication and innovative thinking, we will overcome the feat of climate change. So, Renee, if you are here, if someone is here in your place, could you please join me on stage? Let's have a round of applause. Shadi is here to accept for Rene. Um, Rene received, uh, he was just hired about a month ago by the San Gabriel um, Valley uh, Conservation Corps. Thank you. Yay, so a round of applause for him. So that's why he can't be here today. He's working. But he's, um, he was hired to revitalize their recycling program there. So um, we're really excited for him. So why don't we still take a picture, um, if that's OK? Um, although it doesn't make much sense, does it? <laughs> I'll stand with you so you're not. Okay, yeah. <laughs> All 
Okay, so for our fourth category and the final award for that will be presented today, um, it will be in the category of student leadership. And here is a picture and a, um, oh no, I need to talk about the years previous. So from 2017, the winner was the Eagle Club, Environmental Action Group for Livable Earth, and they, had, they, were, they won as a, they applied as a model student club. In 2017, we had a second winner in student leadership, and that was the Horticultural Club. Uh, they, they worked under the title of the Rhodes Elementary School Garden Revival Project, which is a local elementary school where they went and helped to revitalize their school garden. Um, and I checked in um, with them recently with their club advisor, and it is still going. None of the uh, people who won that award are students anymore, but they continue to do their work, and that is a great sustainable um, model. In 2018, Phi Theta Kappa won for Beyond the Label, uh, the Beyond the Label Sustainability Fashion Event, where they put on a fashion event, I think right here on this stage, to raise awareness about the issues related to fashion and um, environmental degradation. So here is a picture, and um, I will read the essay for the Eagle Club, which won this year. In the fall of 2018, Eagle, uh, the in the fall of 2018, Eagle, the Wildlife Sanctuary Restoration Committee and Biology Club led a fundraising and community service effort to rehabilitate the meadow habitat of Mount Sac's Wildlife Sanctuary. We raised approximately $1,700 from sponsorships, purchased over 50 native plants, and relied entirely on student volunteers. A portion of the funds is also being used to refurbish a greenhouse on campus, on campus and the dual purpose of creating with the dual purpose of creating an educational resource and growing our own native plants in the future. A majority of those who, revisit, who visited our booth were not previously aware of the sanctuary or the importance of native habitats for ecological sustainability. The plant drive was an excellent platform for public outreach as we were able to educate the Mount Sac community on the importance of conservation and the, very, and the various on-campus groups that are aligned with environmentalism. Organizing and executing this plant drive was a novel experience for everyone involved, and we were able to explore the process of event planning and fundraising. In addition, we kept close records and established guidelines so that the plant drive can be replicated in the future. The experience allowed us better understand, uh, to better understand the collaborative nature of community projects as we worked with students, faculty, members, volunteers, and the local botanic garden. Taking this idea from conception to completion was a valuable learning experience and proved that a small group of individuals empowered with effective leadership can bring about long-lasting positive change. Anyone here from Eagle, please join me on stage and let's give them a round of applause. I'm pretty sure I bought one of your plants. I... <laughs> yes. on the screen You're welcome, congratulations. So let's have one more round of applause to show our appreciation and support for all the student work presented today. I would like to thank our very own campus student-led graphic design students, William Gillum and Monico Orozco in Studio 13. We'll William designed the flyer for today's event, and Monaco designed the certificates presented today. By the way, those certificates are printed on sustainable paper made from elephant dung. No trees were cut in their production. <laughs> if you would like to find out more about the Mount Sachs Student Sustainability Awards, um, take a picture of that slide there. Um, also, just about sustainability on campus. Also, on the Sustainability Awards webpage, there is a um, 
link to the library's resources. We have a research guide on sustainability you can explore. And thank you all so much for being here for the third annual Mount Sac President Student Sustainability Awards. I, I will now turn over the mic to James Stone as we transition to our annual Earth Day lecture. Thank you. Lisa, could I ask you to come up? Can everybody hear me out there? Is the mic on? Okay, um, I wanted to, uh, thank you. Mic check. <laughs> okay, thank you, that's better. So I wanted to start off by um, thanking all of the members of the Climate Commitment Implementation Committee. CHISA provided uh, irreplaceable leadership, in particular during the last year, I mean really throughout, but in particular during the last year of the process, Without her, I don't really think the Climate Action Plan would have gotten done when it did, uh, which was the spring of last year, um, and wouldn't have gotten done in the quality that it got done. So I think we all owe you a debt of thanks, Chisa. And you've moved on to bigger and better things as president of the Senate, the Academic Senate. I also want to thank uh, Chris Briggs, who also played a vital part in the completion of the Climate Action Plan, and Cameron Golistani, who uh, conducted the first greenhouse gas inventory that uh, had ever been conducted at Mount Sac. And that's how uh, Renee knew that over 70% of the greenhouse gas emissions on, on campus were produced from the transportation sector. So it's really the Climate Commitment Implementation Committee, but also the larger Sustainability Committee that is giving an award to President Scroggins. Because if President Scroggins hadn't, uh, signed the American College and University President's Commitment on Climate, um, we wouldn't have uh, wound up having the funding that was necessary to complete the Climate Action Plan. Um, and so I wanted to just read a prepared statement. President Scroggins can't be here today. He sends his apologies, but he thanks us for uh, the award, for recognizing his efforts. So uh, if you'll bear with me just briefly while I read this prepared statement, I promise you it won't take too long. So um, I kind of blindsided President Scroggins in the fall of 2012 by asking him at an open faculty forum during Fall Flex Day if he would sign the ACU PCC, and to my surprise, he said yes. So uh, then subsequently, the Faculty Senate um, passed a resolution authored by uh, English faculty member Tom Edson, and the Associated Students passed a resolution authored by Environmental Senator Nora Asawi, and we were uh, off to the races. In uh, fall of 2014, President Scroggins did sign uh, the American College and University President's Commitment on Climate. In our first meeting with him, members of the Sustainability Committee, meeting with President Scroggins, he told us that before he became an administrator, he was a chemistry professor for 26 years. And during that time, he had worked on a methane uh, generator. So, um, you know, you put in organic waste and it creates methane gas, and then you can use the methane gas to power vehicles or, you know, heaters or whatever you want to. And so it was evident at that time, and especially when he told us he recycled aluminum foil from his lunch and plastic bags from his lunch, that he was sincerely committed to sustainability as well as frugality. Um, that was apparent. Um, and it was also evident that he was committed to Mount Sac students. He wanted to provide them with opportunities because he was the one unbidden by us. We didn't come up with the idea for the President's Student Sustainability Awards. He pitched that idea to us, kind of a bolt from the blue. 
And um, all, the president also said that he would provide funding for Mount Sac students to go to sustainability conferences if they wanted to, because there was a uh, question about whether or not student funding could be used for that. So that, that was another illustration of the president's commitment, a genuine commitment to the issue of sustainability and also to our Mount Sac students. So after Mount Sac, uh, after President Scroggins rather signed the ACUPCC, um, the Climate Action Plan was sort of launched. And there were a series of steps that it obligated us to First, conducting the greenhouse ga gas inventory, as I mentioned, Cameron Goldstein did, but then uh, that we would work to incorporate sustainability into the curriculum of the campus. And that's where you played such a vital role, you and Chris, um, in uh, really coming up with all of these um, brilliant ways to make that happen. And we would be remiss if we didn't also mention the Dean of Instruction, former Dean of Instruction, Irene Malgrams, a vital role in incorporating sustainability into every single discipline on campus in terms of its future focus. So uh, she has since left. Then it also committed uh, us to incorporating sustainability into the research agenda of the campus and also to uh, community projects, to partnering with the community in terms of educating about sustainability and also in terms of um, launching joint projects related to sustainability. So uh, once that happened, um, we saw that President Scroggins provided funding for hiring the consultants, that was HMC Architects, that actually carried out the research on greenhouse gas emissions and what kinds of measures we could adopt to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to the point where the college pledged to reach net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 in three different phases. Um, and uh, then he also provided faculty with stipends to be able to uh, write portions of the climate action plan. So that's where Chisa and Chris wrote the portion uh, on integrating sustainability into the curriculum across the curriculum. And uh, HMC wrote the portion having to do with greenhouse gas mitigation. And I wrote portions having to do with policy and community outreach. So Mount Sex Climate Action Plan was completed last year, as I said, at about this time, and it was approved by the President's Advisory Council in May of last year. It required, uh, needless to say, a lot of hard work uh, by faculty members, um, and it also required the support of a lot of dedicated professionals and facilities and planning, Mika Klein, Gary Nellison, and so many others. Um, and also other parts of the campus community. I've mentioned Irene, also people in purchasing as well. Um, and uh, as I said, it couldn't have been completed, uh, lastly but most importantly, without the leadership provided by President Scroggins. So as Paul Hawken, the environmentalist Paul Hawken has said, good management is the art of making problems so interesting and their solutions so constructive that everyone wants to get to work and deal with them. I think former Dean of Instruction Irene Malgram was right when she said of President Scroggins, not everybody realizes it, but they'll miss Bill when he's gone. So thank you for your attention. Word? Yeah, let's do, please. This is a plaque we're going to present to President Scroggins to so, thank him. So it says, Sustainability Champion Dr. William Scroggins for signing the AC, well, it's the American College and University President's Climate Commitment and providing strong support for the development of Mount Sac's first climate action plan 2014 to 2018 presented by the Mount Sac Sustainability <coughs> Committee. And um, while I have the mic, I want to say that James has been very modest in this. He, as he mentioned, was the one who planted the seed. Um, certainly there are, we have other colleagues who've supported this progress over years and years, but it, the signing of the ACU PCC really did start because of your urging of the president. So can we all give James a round of applause? And, I also want to mention that the um, California State Board of Governors of the California Community Colleges awarded Mount SAC um, a prestigious award
for our climate action plan. And uh, the really good thing about that is I think it gives us a little more grease to the wheels to try and make sure that we continue to implement and work towards the goals set out in the climate action plan, hopefully with all of your help. almost forgot, and this is uh, important not to be forgotten, I'd like to introduce my colleague from the Political Science Department, Professor Sierra Powell, who will introduce our Earth Day speaker today. Sierra? Hello, everyone. First, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to come celebrate Earth Day with us and to hear this lecture. I'm here to share with you a little bit about our speaker. Jonathan Rinn holds a PhD in political science with a specialization in international relations from the City University of New York. He is the author of Manufacturing Green Prosperity, The Power to Rebuild the American Middle Class, and also the author of a chapter entitled Every Job Can Be Green in Mandate for Change, Policies and Leadership for 2009 and Beyond, which was published by the Institute for Policy Studies. Additionally, John has published in the American Prospect, The Progressive, and is a frequent contributor to grist.org and other blogs, and is a fellow at the SUNY Univer Institute for Urban Systems. He currently lives in New York City with his wife and two sons, who are also here today, where he does not own a car. Let's give a warm Mount Sat well Welcome to John Rin. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm just going to adjust uh, my screen a little bit here. And if you'll bear with me. And I'm going to go to. Here we are. OK, great. So uh, thank you very much for having me here. Uh, the title of my lecture is Why the Earth Needs a Green New Deal. And um, I was very excited to uh, hear about all the sustainability awards because I think they fit in with what I'm going to talk about. Um, what I'm going to talk about, I, I consider sort of a framework for all the wonderful things that uh, everybody here is doing. And I think I'll managed to mention most of the things that um, uh, were mentioned in those sustainability awards today. Um, it's very appropriate that I'm giving this during Earth Day because, believe it or not, 49 years ago, on April 22nd, 1970, I and a few of my friends uh, started uh, the first Earth Day, had a, were participating in the first Earth Day in sunny Laguna Beach, California, not too far away from here. Uh, and um, what we wanted to do, uh, as everybody wanted to do on that first Earth Day, was talk about all the things that were uh, going on that were harming the Earth and how we could possibly do something about it. So we showed slides of uh, polluting industries and, and um, trees getting cut down, all kinds of awful things like that. But uh, then I went to New York City and um, I started working with um, some other people I worked with uh, a uh, professor by the name of Seymour Melman, who is an international expert on manufacturing and had the frizzy hair to sort of uh, prove it. And, uh, but uh, this was in the 80s, but during uh, 1988 then, of course, James Hansen came up and said, well, hey, uh, you know, we better do something about uh, greenhouse gases because otherwise we're gonna be in big trouble. And then I started to get a PhD in political science. I was more worried about manufacturing and how countries um, rise and decline. Uh, but then in the early 2000s, of course, we had Al Gore, and he was talking about an inconvenient truth. So uh, what this allowed me to do was sort of put together um, both of my interests, the uh, role of manufacturing, how economies work, but also the problem of the Earth being uh, uh, destroyed, basically. So I started writing for Grist, 
And then I wrote a book, Manufacturing Green Prosperity, which sort of put these two ideas together. As you can see, manufacturing can manufacture prosperity for everybody, and it could all be green. And then in a, another chapter in a book called Green Energy Economies, um, uh, co-edited by a member of the IPCC, that's the uh, uh, UN group that uh, does all those uh, big reports on climate change. And there, I actually talked about a uh, $1.7 trillion annual budget that would um, the federal government could use to actually change the entire infrastructure over 20 years. And um, I put this together on a website, which is I've been tweaking ever since. And just to give you an idea, of uh, where we're going today. There's a whole bunch of different uh, projects in a whole bunch of different areas. And um, you can easily see this on the web. And this is number two. And as you see, it's, it's a pretty expensive thing now. It's up to $2 trillion. Uh, but what, what I'm going to try and do is explain all this in a way that is sort of comprehensible, but also comprehensive. And I could invent a new word for that, but I don't think I should. Uh, so what I wanted to do was sort of use this strange diagram that sort of looks like a Game of Thrones sigil and uh, sort of explain where I'm going with um, all of these um, uh, ideas. So uh, what, because what we need to, what I'm going to argue is that we need a concrete plan that the federal government is going to lead, not the market, because at this point in time, there's no other way to eliminate greenhouse gases and prevent climate catastrophe. So in 1988, when James Hansen warned Congress, we were at this green uh, arrow, that is 1,100 gigatons had been put into the atmosphere by humans. Uh, but now here we are uh, at the red arrow uh, in 2000, maybe this is 2017, and we've doubled since James Hansen gave the warning. We went in the opposite direction. So we don't have time, is what I'm going to argue, to play around with the market, although the market could certainly be used uh, to accelerate what we need to do. But I'm going to try and convince you that the federal government actually has to do the bulk of the, of the real work. Because right now, we're basically at 1.2 uh, degrees Celsius above uh, pre-industrial levels. And at the latest, by 2040 or even 2030, we'll hit 1.5 uh, degrees Celsius. So we can't get there. And really, we better be at zero by 2050. Uh, and so my program um, is designed to work in 20 years. Um, uh, so uh, what, we, what we've seen is that in the face of all this scientific evidence, we've got hurricanes, and we've had floods, we've had fires, we've had droughts. I feel like I'm giving a biblical speech here. And nothing. The political system has been asleep. And then, ta-da, uh, partly from my uh, now hometown of New York City, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and the Sunrise Movement, which also sounds like a rock band, but um, she and they somehow opened up the eyes of the body, body politic for at least a little bit. And everybody uh, thought, hey, maybe it would be a good idea to pour a lot of money into actually just fixing the problem. And, th and that way you could also generate millions of jobs and improve the economy at the same time. Wow, what a great idea. So uh, she and uh, Senator Markey came up with uh, a global, I, I'm sorry, a Green New Deal resolution, which has a bunch of goals, but not um, concrete uh, uh, action. So what I'm going to show you is compatible with what they're doing. But uh, I like to think it goes a little bit further. I'm not going to get too much into the climate change aspect of it and how bad it is. You can read really depressing books like this one, The Uninhabitable Earth. Uh, but it's just enough to know that um, what I'm going to show you are how you can uh, decrease greenhouse gas emissions for particular sectors of the economy. And that will eventually lead to uh, the, uh, the, the, the goal of not having any greenhouse gas emissions. So um, the problem has been that the federal government has been considered sort of like the wimpy kid who can't do anything and is a big failure. Um, but, and this sort of started out in the age of Reagan. He said famously, the government is the problem, not the solution. There is no alternative to the market. 
Uh, and um, this was sort of strange because most Americans at best have a faint memory of a time when the federal government could do some big things like they landed a man on the moon. Um, they did all kinds of things and we're gonna go sort of go through that. So could it be that the government could be the solution to climate change and income inequality? Well, what you sort of see a lot are things like the federal government could help the market by uh, having a carbon tax or tax breaks and the market could fix the problem. But what I'm going to talk about is the federal government building the infrastructure and then the government fixes the problem. In other words, the government does not just help the market to fix the problem, the government directly fixes the problem. Um, and this way you, we can guarantee that uh, the problem will be fixed. So the market will ser can serve as a um, accelerator to what the government is doing. Uh, and this doesn't have to actually be particularly partisan because uh, Abraham Lincoln and the first Republicans uh, formed partly in order to use the government to turn the United States into a manufacturing power. They wanted the federal government to do things. They wanted to stop slavery. They wanted to impose tariffs to help manufacturing. They built infrastructure. They built physical infrastructure, like helping to build the Intercontinental Railroad. They also built a uh, land-grant college system that uh, sort of uh, the community college system is, is a part of. I went to UC Berkeley, which is part, was one of the original land-grant colleges. So they, they put together these massive national networks all the way back in the 19th century. And so what eventually happened was they succeeded. The United States became what's called a great power, one of the countries that uh, has sway uh, over global decisions. And the Republicans can continue to uh, build the nation as it were, Teddy Roosevelt and uh, the Panama Canal, even conservative presidents like Calvin Coolidge and Herbert Hoover, they built the Hoover Dam, it's named after Herbert Hoover. But uh, it is the Green New Deal that uh, really is the inspiration for, I mean, sorry, it's the original New Deal that is really the inspiration for the Green New Deal. And so we should understand what the New Deal was because after all, that's what the Green New Deal is named after. It shouldn't just be a marketing thing or a branding thing. Uh, I saw an editorial recently talking about a market-centered Green New Deal, which doesn't make any sense. It's what they call an oxymoron. Uh, so um, what happened in the Green New Deal, in the original New Deal, was that the federal government simply built a lot of infrastructure and hired a lot of people to do it. So, for instance, most famously, there was something called the WPA, the Work Progress Administration. Uh, it composed about 2% of GDP, which in today's terms would be $400 billion a year, and they employed about 3% of, of employment, which today would be 8 million jobs. It was quite a substantial project, and they built a lot of the infrastructure that is falling apart today. Uh, there was another large part of this system called the PWA, the uh, Progress, uh, the Public Works Administration, they built the really huge projects. They subcontracted to companies and then those companies built it, but the government was uh, basically in control of the situation. And we still have things running today like uh, the Tennessee Valley Authority. So we, I think we can draw many lessons from history. So you can have lessons, you can even get a lesson here. Uh, the number one, the first lesson is the federal government can very successfully plan and manage big, complicated, government-owned infrastructure projects that employ millions of people. They can do it. Um, the, the New Deal also had another very successful, and actually this was the most uh, um, popular project called the CCC, the Civilian Conservation Corps. And what they did is they went around the country particularly during the Dust Bowl, which was this horrible uh, drought really that happened in the middle of the country, and they helped plant millions and millions of trees, and they also did all kinds of other ecological, ecological restoration. So that's something that we could do today. So lesson number two is that the government can very successfully rebuild and restore ecosystems. So um, it can be very green. But even the New Deal is not large enough to fix the problem of the Great Depression. It took World War II and the federal government spending as much as one third of the economy on the war to finally put the economy out of the Great Depression. 
So the government even paid for a whole new set of industrial machinery that company used after the war, and we're going to talk about something like that a little bit later. So the federal government after World War II uh, created some more systems and helped some more systems along. They had the GI Bill, which helped people get new homes and, and uh, provided money for college. My father uh, used this because he was a... Uh, he had been fought in World War II, and he eventually became a professor because of the opportunity to have this GI Bill. Uh, it built the interstate highway system, the largest public works project in world history. If you want to call it this, the most socialist thing that's ever been created, the interstate highway system. And so we also created an, an R&D system. So another uh, lesson is that the federal government must continuously redesign the set of basic infrastructure systems if we want to create a better society. So after World War II, with all this construction going on, manufacturing boomed. There were millions of people being employed by, this, by the, all this construction. Uh, and uh, the middle class uh, did really well. And so number, lesson number four, is that by building infrastructure, the federal government can help maintain or rebuild the manufacturing sector. Well, something else went on at, during this time, too. Um, there was so much work that even the racist creeps that ran most companies back then relented and hired African-American and Latino workers, thus making for a solid working class in most communities of color. So millions of African-American families, for instance, came north they made their way to cities like Newark, New Jersey, and all the good faces from Newark, and they uh, took advantage of all the good factory jobs there. At the same time, all workers saw their incomes rising through the 1960s because there was so much work to do, partly because of what the uh, government, federal government was doing. So lesson number five, the final lesson here, is I'll go, it's all going to be on the test, don't worry. The federal government can help defeat bigotry in the workplace and keep wages and income rising by spending money that leads to low unemployment. But then, in the mid-60s, a big turn. Uh, we went from the Great Society, Lyndon Johnson had the Great Society, to the Vietnam War. And in the middle 60s, manufacturing started to decline. Newark, instead of being a source of jobs, uh, became a disaster. It, 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 uh, there was a riot, and there were lots of riots. And I think what people don't understand was that because that was because deindustrialization hit communities of color before they hit other communities, and so people were uh, pissed off. Um, and we also see here, you can see that um, that line that goes up. That's basically where wages and income should have gone from 1973, but instead they went where that's flat, and that's why. Most Americans haven't seen much of a raise in decades, and they've been getting very mad about it. And there have been some very negative political uh, repercussions, including this uh, rising specter of, of what you call neo-fascism or whatever. Um, so we want to try and get back to this, and this is why, in case you're wondering, one of the uh, main goals of the Green New Deal is to get people back up to where they're enjoying the, the gains that technology provides. So uh, federal spending on new and expanded infrastructure leads to healthy ecosystems. It leads to thriving manufacturing and low unemployment. And it leads to rising incomes and less bigotry. So I hope I've laid out uh, 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 at least part of a case for why you might want to consider the federal government doing things. So uh, what it, is it that the federal government should build? Well, what we have here are we're showing basically what we have to do. Uh, these are the percentages of greenhouse gases uh, on the uh, right there is uh, the United States. On the left is globally. Uh, and so the very first thing that we have to work on is electricity, because that will then allow us to decarbonize, that is, remove greenhouse gases from many of the other sectors. Um, so we need to build a lot of wind farms, solar uh, panel, uh, solar farms. Uh, we can take advantage, if the federal government does all this, and it's all very fine to give incentives to do this sort of thing, but if the federal government does all this, they can 
create a very efficient system using uh, figuring out where the wind blows uh, at all times of the, of the night and day uh, or where this uh, solar energy is so that you always have this constant uh, inflow of, of re renewable uh, energy. So our first piece of our diagram here, I'm proposing an interstate renewable electricity system. Just as we have an interstate highway system, we could have an interstate renewable electricity system the federal government would build and own and operate. And this could be very efficient as uh, Stanford professor Mark Jacobson, who has been leading in this field, uh, has been calculating, so I didn't have to do all these calculations myself. Uh, so he shows that by 2050, uh, basically the whole planet could be using renewable electricity. Um, and so it is doable. Um, so uh, the advantages of the federal government simply building this, just doing it, as Nike says, is that it would be more reliable. They could uh, design an up-to-date, state-of-the-art national system, unlike the scattered system we have now. It would be less expensive for consumers. Uh, you're always being scared by the idea that renewable electricity will be more expensive. No, if you do it in a national way, so you get, you get economies of scale, it should actually be cheaper. Um, it should be healthier. There won't be the pollution from coal plants, which some people say um, have studied, have said uh, cause 30,000 deaths a year. Uh, and then you'd have millions of guaranteed jobs. So what, what I'm trying to show here is that the Green New Deal could bring lots and lots of benefits. There's lots of things that people would want to have. It's not a, a question of sacrificing and hard times and higher prices and losing jobs. These are all concrete benefits that can come from that. So once we have our interstate renewable electric, electricity system, say that five times quickly, then we can also talk about buildings, which cause uh, a, a decent amount of um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, even after you um, use their electricity from the uh, electrical, uh, clean electricity, there's still a lot of like natural gas and stuff like that that buildings use. So what we, the federal government can, can again come in and uh, help uh, build um, things like uh, solar panels, obviously, uh, geothermal uh, heat pumps, which are a very interesting technology that can be used to uh, replace all heating and cooling and requires only one third of the electricity of normal um, uh, electrical heating and cooling. Uh, I could do retrofitting, which I, I think I heard somebody mention. And also, uh, you could put a battery in a building. And then once you put a battery in the building, then things get really great because then you could hook it up to the interstate renewable electricity system, and it could be a storage, it could help with that system, it could be sort of integrated to that system and increase um, efficiency even more. So uh, here is our uh, uh, mysterious uh, shape for uh, buildings. And um, now what we need to attack is transportation. So uh, we, we were just talking about um, I think uh, Professor Stone was just mentioning like 70% of the greenhouse gases from Mount Sac are from transportation. Uh, in, internationally, it's 14%. Uh, nationally, it's 29%. California, it's 41%. So this is a huge problem. There are all kinds of cultural issues, which I will try to get around somehow. But um, let's talk about, say, what an ideal system would look like. And so I think the, at the center of, of an ideal system would be another interstate. And this interstate could be an interstate high-speed rail system. So you would have this re rail system that uses the electricity from the interstate renewable electricity system. So it would be clean and be affordable. It would be very comfortable. Uh, the uh, US High-Speed Rail Association has uh, proposed uh, something like this. I could actually just maybe even use uh, the median strips of a lot of the uh, interstate highway system. Uh, and despite the problems that California has been having, and I realize that the, that has happened, uh, that should not deter anyone because there are plenty of nice, shiny, new high-speed rail systems all around the world. Here's a Chinese um, a train, and here's the Chinese network, which is huge, probably as big as
I hear the French have, have of course, uh, probably the fastest trains going up to Lincoln. about it would be is that it could go right into the middle of town, of a city, and then if you're in the city, if you're in a walk, what I call a walkable neighborhood, you could get on transit, you can, you can hop on transit or just walk to the main rail station. So here in New York City, uh, Grand Central Station, uh, Penn Station, those could be the feeders off to an interstate um, high-speed rail system. And this is ideal. The only problem is that only 5% of the country lives in a walkable neighborhood, most of it in New York City. So uh, it turns out that um, allegedly 25% of uh, the United States would like, of the households in the United States would like to live in a walkable neighborhood. And that well, walkable neighborhood means you don't have to use your car. You could use your car, but you don't have to. So it actually gives you more choice. And after all, that's the meaning of freedom, right? More choice. So a walkable neighborhood could actually equal more freedom. Uh, so, uh, but in order to do that, uh, right now, uh, walkable neighborhoods are extremely expensive because they're very desirable and there isn't enough housing. So logically, the way to do that then is to put more housing in, but the market isn't doing that. So the federal government would need to do that. And as my example, uh, my family and I uh, lived in Evanston, Illinois, just north of uh, Chicago for a couple of years. And we moved to this uh, lovely uh, apartment building. It was very comfortable, very affordable. And it had replaced a parking lot in what had been a, uh, a downtown that had been falling apart. You know, main streets all across the country are falling apart, small towns and big towns. And uh, what Evanston did was they decided to turn it all around. And instead, they built residential buildings in, in the center of town, which would then support commercial buildings like Barnes & Noble and Whole Foods, et cetera. And there are uh, transit lines coming through here. So it's a perfect example of what we could do uh, with the rest of the country if we wanted to do. So if we wanted, say, 100,000 Evanston-style 250-unit apartment buildings, so we get 25% of the public into walkable neighborhoods, do that over 20 years, uh, one-third of the households uh, could, could be in a walkable neighborhood. And um, so this is something to consider. This is something that generally people don't talk about when they talk about Green New Deal because I think it just sounds too um, uh, expensive. But uh, after all, over the last 80 years, we've uh, managed to uh, spread out where people live. So we could spend the next 20 years uh, relocating people into uh, town and city centers if we like to do. But for the two thirds of the people say who would not, who would still be in a suburb, uh, it would make it easier now if um, one third were in uh, walkable neighborhoods to then help everybody else convert to electric vehicles. And uh, I don't mean uh, Tesla's, I mean like a Nissan Leaf or something like that. Um, and so let's say the federal government gave you half of the price of an electric car. Considering that the uh, uh, fuel cost of an electric car, the electrical cost is, can be like one third what the gas cost is for a gas car, if, if uh, the government would just push this along by making it cheaper to buy an electric car than a gas car, the whole industry would shift over and I think it would make it much easier to uh, then decrease the greenhouse gas emissions of Mount Sac, for instance. Um, however, there is a problem that the suburbs have, something that I just want to mention here. There's a site called strongtowns.org, and they're a bunch of civil engineers, and their, their message basically is <laughs> not a very fun one, but uh, it's that suburbia and rural areas are slowly going bankrupt because they really can't afford to keep track of, to maintain all these roads and infrastructure that were built out by the federal government so long ago. And so everything is sort of falling apart and you don't want to overtax people, but what are you going to do? Well, the American Society of Civil Engineers has come up with an infrastructure report card and they have shown how you could rebuild basically suburbia uh, and keep it going for a while longer, which I think would be the politically um, uh, smart thing to do. Uh, but I also want to say here that I think uh, the Green New Deal has to get a little bit 
politically uh, tough and say, okay, look, if, if you want your suburbs to be uh, re rebuilt, then you better vote for people who are going to vote for the Green New Deal. So this is part of my uh, maybe New York City political machine uh, thinking coming through, but that's, uh, maybe that's a way to do it. Or maybe people would decide, hey, they really like walkable neighborhoods. Uh, maybe we should, uh, instead of 25%, maybe 50% of the public would like to be in one. So uh, there, there needs to be a national conversation about how to do this. So uh, here we have our uh, hashtag to uh, sort of show urban structure, how people uh, live. But one of the reasons people don't like to live in the cities now is that uh, the declining state of public schools. So strangely enough, in order to make the Green New Deal happen or, or help make it happen to get people into um, uh, dense cities, you need to improve the public education, which is okay because we need to upgrade the technological capacity of the American workforce. And historically, actually, community colleges and technical schools, vocational schools, have been a very important part of, of uh, having this, the actual skills for people to actually do useful work. So I would say that just on a purely practical point of view, we need free public colleges, more free technical schools. We need federal aid to public schools to get them up to the level where they should be instead of uh, just the creaky uh, uh, state systems that we have now. And we need universal pre-K and child care. We need all this so that we can have a skilled workforce so they can build all the stuff that I'm talking about. So uh, I would put at the center of this whole educational effort uh, my third interstate, which is an interstate high-speed internet system. So that's why you could offer free internet to schools, actually to individuals as well. But you could also, again, upgrade the technological capacity of the country. Uh, this is what the internet grid looks like now. But the Koreans, for instance, have a much faster internet than we do. And they did that because the uh, government put it all together. So what we have here are uh, nice, uh, affordable, cheap, hopefully interesting systems that we're putting together for a Green New Deal. And on top of all that, all this stuff needs to be manufactured. So there could be millions of jobs for people to manufacture if we make sure that um, all the Green New Deal uh, um, parts are ma manufactured in the country, this country. In other words, the, it's called domestic content. You have to uh, uh, require domestic content. So you'd have to build your high-speed rail trains and your subways, your wind turbines, your solar panels, your uh, housing uh, products. And this would be really great because it turns out that um, to recreate the engine of economic growth that had led to the widely shared prosperity of the 30 years after World War II, and at the same time, we can make sure that all communities share in prosperity, including communities of color, uh, what we need to do is provide enough orders, as it were, to the manufacturing so that infrastructure helps manufacturing. And then on the other hand, manufacturing helps infrastructure by continuously improving and continuously helping the infrastructure. So you get what's called a virtuous circle of infrastructure and manufacturing helping each other. And then that drives the economy into widely shared economic growth. Uh, there's an example of this I'm near where I live. They just rebuilt this bridge. And they used uh, a, a crane, as you see on the right there, this huge crane that cost $50 million. But that huge crane saved $1 billion. Uh, and so this is what happens when industrial machinery gets better. Then uh, everything else gets cheaper. Everything else gets uh, more higher quality. Uh, and so we need, uh, these are like machine tools. Um, and we need all these to um, also uh, improve. Uh, these are the machinery that is used to make the little pieces that go into your phones. Uh, you might know more about, uh, you know, the, the, the most obscure ecosystem in the world than you do about these things, but these are what power the improvements so you, that your phone is, is, is better all the time. This is the industrial machinery sort of at the, at the center 
of the economy, and the Green New Deal can actually help the American industrial machinery sector by um, allowing us to uh, requ requiring us to build all this stuff, and we need the industrial machinery to build all the stuff. And once we make this stuff, then it goes into the service sector, as we see here, like all oh, everything in retail is um, selling stuff that was made in a factory. But the problem is that the people who work in retail don't make as much as the people in the factory. And so what happened here was manufacturing had 25% of employment and 25% of income in 1968. That means a quarter of the economy, a quarter of people were involved with manufacturing. So now only 9% of employment is in manufacturing and 12% of, of income. Well, where did that income and, and employment go to? The employment went to the lower uh, paying service sector and the income went to the smaller employing uh, finance uh, sector. So this is, part, this is like maybe the major reason that you see income inequality increasing is because manufacturing uh, has declined and uh, the finance has, has increased their power. So another way to show that industrial machinery is important is to just show you uh, sort of generally what happens when a country produces most of the industrial machinery of a uh, in the world, that's those sets of countries are the ones who basically wind up controlling the world because then they can build a military, they can build a powerful economy. So it's a very important set of, of, uh, of machinery. And so, but to bring us back to what, what manufacturing has to do uh, for the Green New Deal, uh, we see here that uh, industry actually creates about 22% of the greenhouse gases, so we have to do something about it. It's almost as it's actually worse than coal, because uh, coal is about 18% total. So how are we going to uh, deal with this? Be well, now we know why I was blabbering on about industrial machinery, because we have to replace that industrial machinery in order to cut down on the greenhouse gas emissions. We also need to replace it so that we can deal with what we were talking about 49 years ago in the first Earth Day to decrease pollution um, and so um, this is what's called uh, cradle-to-cradle -cradle production or recycling or reusing the goods. That, uh, that is every good, even your phones, for instance, would be recyclable and you could pull them apart, you could reuse the pieces, put them back into new products, and that way you wouldn't have to do mining, which is destroying the planet, as we uh, talked about 49 years ago. So if the federal government uh, just like in World War II, uh, paid for a new industrial machinery, we could get, uh, we could solve the pollution problem, we could get rid of the fossil fuel use, the 22%, we could turn it into a society, society that's reusing, recycling, not dumping stuff in uh, landfills all the time. Uh, and, but we could also have cheaper, higher quality goods. They'd be cheaper because the machinery had been paid for and you could return it, you get money, your money back in millions of good jobs, and you'd have a healthier population, less pollution, you'd minimize mining, and your ecosystems would be healthier. So all this would happen, strangely enough, by attacking the manufacturing part of a Green New Deal. Um, so th now I can put in my little blue bar here and, and almost uh, finish this. Uh, um, uh, diagram, but what we have to do now is we have to talk about the uh, sort of last main sector of the society that's destroying the planet, and it's the agricultural part, which is almost the worst part in some ways. It causes uh, globally uh, almost a quarter of emissions. The U.S. is 9%. This is mostly from those burping cows that you may have heard about why you know, we want to take everybody's cow away, but also from soil, uh, destroying the soil. But globally, the problem is that deforestation is causing uh, much of this, um, uh, much of the problem. And so we have to do something about that. And so I was uh, very pleased before you came uh, in the Sustainability Awards, they were calling them the Regeneration Awards, 
And uh, that's exactly what uh, some people uh, call uh, uh, the, the newer kind of agriculture that we would like to have so that we have organic agriculture. We're not using pesticides. We're not using artificial fertilizers. We're not destroying the soil. We're not destroying the ecosystems. And um, everybody's healthier because they have better food. They could have cheaper food. Um, they could, uh, <clears throat> and we could do this again with the federal government supplying the machinery and the implements and the training to be able to have a regenerative agricultural system. We could have, and also we could have more urban gardens. We, uh, I know, uh, I, I think uh, you guys have uh, something like that, which is fantastic. And the other great thing about this is that we really need to. Uh, pull down a lot of the greenhouse gases that are up there in order to pr avoid getting to the two degrees of Celsius above pre-industrial levels, because t at two degrees, it gets really scary. Uh, you know, you, you start uh, having nightmares about that book I showed you. Uh, uh, it, it could actually run away to even three degrees, which then just becomes a real nightmare. So what you need to do is you need to uh, reforest, uh, restore ecosystems, which just happens to be what the Civilian Conservation Corps of the New Deal was doing. So what we need is we need another Civilian Conservation Corps. So now we have our whole diagram, but we need one more piece. We have to make this thing global because uh, the United States is not the only country that is producing greenhouse gases. So, uh, believe it or not, here comes industrial machinery again because what the U.S. did after World War II to uh, bring back the economies of our allies, of the Europe, Europeans, of the Japanese, was it provided something called the Marshall Plan, provided a lot of industrial machinery and other help to help revive all these economies, and it was very successful. It's one of the great success stories of the 20th century. Well, we could do something very similar. Uh, the developed countries could give the developing countries lots of industrial machinery to make their own Green New Deals, and in return, this again is my New York City machine politics mind thinking, the developing countries would have to promise not to tear down the Amazon and destroy Borneo and destroy all the other rainforests and destroy their ecosystem, they'd have to let us help them actually protect it. Um, and then so the developed countries would get lots more jobs producing all that industrial machinery, so it would be a benefit to them. And then another part of this, I think, has to be we have to think about how are we going to deal with um, the agricultural problem that half of the agricultural use is to make cattle, to make beef. In short, to make cheap burgers. And as the Chinese, for instance, become richer, they want more cheap burgers. So that means they want to wipe out the uh, Amazon so they get more and more cows, so they get cheaper and cheaper burgers. But if we want to save the Amazon, if we actually want to reforest a lot of what's being used for cattle now, what are we going to do? Well, one thing we could do is try and replace cattle with fish. And, but to do that, then we'd have to protect the oceans because the fish are being horribly overfished. And then maybe uh, they could come back after a few years and provide a lot of uh, replacement for uh, livestock. So that would be, that's another example of how if you think about these things on a systems level, uh, it's great to think about things on, on uh, the details and things that people can do, things that institutions can do, things that localities can do, but there's some things that need to be done on a national level and even need to be done on a global level. And this is, I think, a good example of that. So as I said, we have to get every other country on board. And in particular, China here has become a real big problem. But if we were producing our own manufactured goods, then their carbon dioxide levels could go way down because they wouldn't have to produce goods for us. I don't know if they'd like that too much. but. Perhaps we could, again, negotiate and say, look, why don't you just spend all your time uh, greening your economy and, and stop making all these uh, gadgets for us, uh, and then we'd all be in a lot better shape because you don't want to lose Shanghai either. So what I want to show is that all this 
stuff comes together because we can plan, we can figure out exactly what we want to do, uh, and we can even use it as a platform to elect officials. We can say, okay, look, we have this plan. If you support it, we'll vote for you. Uh, we can calculate how much employment people would um, have, and I, I've calculated 20 million new people. So the people who are doing part-time jobs, the people who have dropped out of the job market, uh, people who just don't like the job they have, they'd have very good jobs uh, available to them. We could even eliminate poverty. One of the ideas coming out of the Green New Deal that Ocasio-Cortez has put forward is the idea of a federal job guarantee. And the idea there is that if anybody who wants a job could get one, and that way, basically, you'd eliminate poverty because everybody uh, would have enough income to support their family on a decent level. Uh, we can also assure all people in all communities, communities of color, uh, white communities hit by the op opioid crisis, every com urban professionals, every community, that the jobs will be fairly distributed, that factories will be placed in a fairly distributed way. And we can know that because we can say exactly where everything's going to go, and we can do that because we can plan it. Um, and then we can determine what good jobs people in disappearing industries can have. There's a lot of press about a lot of labor unions don't like the idea of the Green New Deal because some of their members will lose jobs. Well, um, if you plan everything carefully, you could say plan to have a wind turbine factory right near the oil refinery that is going to shut down, and then all those people could just walk over to the wind turbine factory and they'd have a nice new job, uh, and then everybody would be happy. So. Um, uh, another thing that people usually uh, um, get um, uh, try and uh, argue against uh, Green New Deal uh, about is how do you pay for it? Well, there's several ways to do this, and I don't want to go into too much detail, but suffice it to say that private banks, you might not know, every year create about $500 billion out of thin air uh, in order to create investment money so that the economy grows. Well, the federal government could do the same thing with the Federal Infrastructure Bank. Um, they could also generate revenue from all of this stuff. They could generate revenue from the electrical system, from the train system, even building the houses, from the internet. Um, so they could uh, afford to, uh, they could simply use that revenue to build all these things. And eventually they could even reduce middle class income taxes, perhaps. Um, they could tax the very wealthy and large corporations for about 10 to 20 years the time needed to get all these systems up and running. Uh, we had this huge tax cut, which we don't need. Um, we're at very low levels. Corporations paid much more in taxes during the Eisenhower administration. So there's plenty of room there. And then we can direct, redirect money from the military budget and other unnecessary programs because the military there is supposed to be there for our national security. Well, this is our national security. And in any case, a lot of the military uh, if we don't do something, it's going to spend all their time rescuing people from flooding and droughts and fires and all that sort of thing anyway. And uh, also, I just want to say again, I don't think that it's going to sell very well to be uh, proposing taxes on the working and middle classes uh, because, uh, as, as you can see here, I'm trying to sell this thing. Uh, I think it all makes a lot of logical sense, but it also has to be saleable. So, uh, as we see, there are lots of benefits to a Green New Deal. There, you can get, we should have higher income and better jobs. Um, we could have better health from better food, no pollution, more walking, better education system, more affordable housing and walkable neighborhoods, cheaper, better American-made reusable manufactured goods. You won't have to worry about you are messing up the environment by buying something. Cheaper, more comfortable electric travel and trains and cars. Uh, and, uh, you know, as opposed to the, what are the costs in this system? I mean, they're always saying there's always huge costs. Well, maybe the burgers would get more expensive. So I don't know whether the whole thing is going to, you know, the whole campaign is going to be, you know, keep your burger prices low. I, I don't know if that's going to be the campaign against the Green New Deal. Maybe Uber rides would get more expensive because. Uh, people would have better uh, employment opportunities. You wouldn't have to drive Uber. Um, you'd get more taxes if you were rich or a big corporation. And if you were a big oil company, your power might go down. So, that, so um, you know, that's 
uh, something that uh, is a cost, but it's not a cost for 99% of the population. So I hope you have seen almost 50 years after the first Earth Day how we can finally fulfill its promise. What we distantly saw all those years ago was that something terribly wrong was going on and that we had to do something about it. What we now know is that the civilization itself has to be redesigned. The energy, transportation, manufacturing, agriculture, and housing systems have to be reconstructed. In order to do that, we have to create tens of millions of good jobs and make sure the public is well-educated, healthy, and well-informed. We can't just let the market, which has its good points, control the direction of our civilization. We need the democratically elected government working with the participation of local communities and citizens to create a new blueprint for a sustainable, just civilization. Planet Earth needs a global Green New Deal. Thank you very much. I think it's on. Yeah, I heard it. Okay, there we go. And before we get going with a question and answer period, the Eagle Club has an announcement they'd like to make. Thank you. Um, hi, guys. My name's Lynette. I'm the president of the Eagle Club, which is the environmental club on campus. We actually have another event in the Wildlife Sanctuary at 1.45, um, so you guys have plenty of time to stay for the Q&A for this event. If you're interested in coming, um, we are having a wild plant expert come, and he's gonna show us um, some different uses for a lot of native plants and how that kind of helps us reconnect with nature. So if you'd like to go, uh, we have some Eagle officers here. Just look for them in this green shirt, and around 1.25, um, they're gonna take a group over to the Wildlife Sanctuary. That's across the street at the corner of Mount Sac Way and Temple. Okay, thank you. So let's first give um, Dr. Rin another round of applause for such a great talk. And now we'll be accepting some questions from the audience. So just go ahead and raise your hand. Yes. That's okay. Uh, just a quick question in regards to your uh, high-speed railway system. Uh huh. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, actually, that was from the U.S. High Speed Rail Association. And, um, you know, this is something that somebody actually put together. I put it up there, but you're right. And I, I want to also point out that um, a good selling point of a high speed rail system could be that you could reconnect a lot of those small towns and those rural states into the national economy because with the air system, you know, they do this hub and spoke thing and they basically sort of uh, some of those smaller cities and towns are dying because they're not integrated into the you know, um, uh, national system. And another thing I, I, I didn't point out was that this would also be a high-speed freight rail system. So that, that would really help the rural areas too because they could get their stuff to market. So uh, that's a good point. I, uh, that you know, um, the high-speed rail system should be sold as something that uh, the rural areas could, and, and the, the, the smaller areas could, could um, benefit from, definitely. And by the way, please give me a hard time. I want to so hear we'll hard questions. we'll take that questions. one in the middle right there. Hi there. Thank Hi. you for your uh, lecture. It was very interesting. I have a question for you, though, mm -hmm. in uh, regards to this rail system. So I'm not going to say where, but the company that I work at 
uh, stated when we were in training that they saw a 70% increase in theft once the, uh, the rail line was set up next to the company. Do you think that we are ready <laughs> for these small communities to become integrated, especially here in a place like LA? You know, the people here in Southern California are not as friendly as say other places like Portland or up in Humboldt County. What do you say about that? Um, well, uh, you know, uh, basically most of the country really developed during the rail era you know, and um, I mean, I don't know, I've taken Amtrak and people are pretty friendly on, on uh, Amtrak. I don't know, uh, you know, people get uh, afraid that if you connect up them up too easily to other places that the wrong element will come in or something like that. Um, but see, well, you know, this might be another example where uh, the, um, the, uh, whole is greater than the, 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 the um, sum of the parts because if everyone has a good job, uh, then you don't have to really worry about theft as much. Actually, uh, the Green New Deal could be sold as an anti-crime bill because, you know, if everyone's got a good job, that just historically has cut way down on crime. So that's one of the examples where it actually helps when you have such a huge, you know, it seems like such a huge program. If you have such a huge program, uh, it helps you make these connections together and, and all these problems can sort of be solved at the same time. Does, does that sound uh, reasonable? I, I see where you're going with this, but where would these jobs be coming from? Uh, what do you mean, where would the jobs be? You, you mentioned that with new jobs, we could see a reduction in crime. Mm -hmm. But where are these jobs going to be coming from? Well, yeah, well, that's why, um, um, well, in, in my Green New Deal plan.com, I, I specify all the millions of jobs that each one of these programs would generate. And that's what was an advantage of the federal government actually creating these networks, like the interstate highway system they created, and it generated millions of jobs. So the interstate renewable electricity system would generate millions of jobs. The interstate high, high speed rail system would generate millions of jobs, manufacturing all that stuff would generate millions of jobs. And it, they all be pretty much guaranteed. So they wouldn't be coming from companies, entrepreneurs deciding, oh, uh, let me try a new product. All of that could happen too. They'd be coming because you know that there would be these 20 million new jobs that the federal government would uh, 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 generate. Does that sound reasonable? I mean, it might sound, uh, wow, they could do, you know, can they do something like that? But that's the logic of the situation. Okay, and then there's a question right there in the green. Hi, I, um, I just wanted to know because you, we use the original New Deal and the programs that came after World War II as a basis for the Green New Deal, but we see, <laughs> we saw in those, in those plans specifically with the GI Bill and other things like that, that there was a very lopsided um, growth, especially for people who were, who were mostly white and male, especially in housing discrimination and job discrimination people Veter white veterans were more likely to get these low interest loans than people, uh, veterans from people of color communities. How is it that we can avoid those pitfalls again to assure a more equal and just growth in this Green New Deal than before? Yeah, I'm glad you brought up that point. And uh, I, I didn't mention a lot of these things. So I was hoping it was come from the audience. Uh, the, uh, you know, Ocasio-Cortez and, and her People are working very hard, first of all, to make sure that doesn't happen. They're very concerned about that. There's a lot of, you know, work on, on uh, what happened in the, in the New Deal that was not uh, good. And so that's why I was stressing, you know, let's think about, well, with federal planning, you know, you could go into a, a community of color, I don't know, say Harlem, because I live in New York City, and you say, okay, um, <clears throat> You know, we want to put a factory. Uh, Harlem used to, uh, most of its employment came from the textile industry. You know, we, we want to have this factory here that would help this, you know, people in Harlem. We want to do, uh, build these buildings. We want to, we want to uh, retrofit all the buildings. The people who do that would need to come from the community. Uh, there's a term, um, I can't remember the term, but the term is basically the uh, people who work on projects have to reflect the diversity of their community. Uh, so when you have planning, strangely enough, uh, when you have federal planning, you can actually make it more democratic 
by decentralizing a lot of the decision making, getting, getting back from the communities how they want this thing to be implemented. And that would probably take a little bit longer, you know, but it's worth it because, yeah, we certainly don't want to uh, make some of the same mistakes that we made in the original Green New, uh, the original New Deal. There was a question with the glasses. Do you want to ask? You're okay. Uh, right there. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, my question is for the. I'm assuming most of the new jobs are from manu manufacturing, and how do you account for the new workforce? that aren't interested in manufacturing jobs? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Actually, most of the jobs are not in manufacturing. Probably most of them, the biggest chunk, if people really wanted to build walkable communities in those 100,000, 250 unit apartment buildings, that would probably be most, the biggest uh, chunk would be construction jobs. Uh, manufacturing would be uh, maybe about a quarter of the jobs that I'm describing here. A lot of it would be operational, you know, operating the wind farms and the transit systems and all that sort of thing. Uh, but yeah, a lot of the um, ma manufacturing uh, jobs would be there. But just keep in mind, uh, uh, my budget there at the moment is $2 trillion. That's, it sounds like a lot, but it's only 10% of the economy. So you're really talking about a rather well, it's the big part, but it's not huge. So, um, so, uh, so for people who are, you know, in a working class, want to be in that sort of work, and also, by the way, it would be more high tech. It wouldn't be just the repetitive stuff, be a lot of programming. But what I also want to emphasize is that there would be a lot of professional work that would go along with that, in particular engineering. Uh, engineering is in really tro big trouble in this country, partly because the, the manufacturing isn't there. I mean, you can't, and, and the infrastructure building isn't there. You can't be a civil engineer if no one's building anything. You can't be a mechanical engineer if no one's uh, making anything. So this would be a great boon for engineering. In fact, that might be a big bottleneck in a Green New Deal is to get enough engineers and actually highly skilled manufacturing workers. Oh, you know, those professions have deteriorated in the United States. And um, as I should, my, my uh, sort of mentor there, Seymour Melman, is probably spinning in his grave because I mean, it just, the whole thing has just, uh, has just deteriorated uh, in, in a horrible way. And on top of that, I mean, I think the educational system would offer a lot of opportunities for people, but the whole economy would be in so much better shape. I think it would be much better for people who, uh, even outside of manufacturing construction. Let's come a little closer to the front in the blue right there. Researchers at the University of Oxford found that eliminating meat and dairy products from your diet could potentially reduce an individual's carbon footprint from food by up to 73%. Now that seems pretty significant. I was just wondering why you didn't recommend a reduction or complete elimination of such in addition to, say, regenerative agriculture. Uh, yeah, well, I, I did, but I sort of probably went through it sort of quickly. That was the part about uh, again, logically, is there a way to get people off of meat? And one way would be, or at least off of cattle, and one way would be, say, to make uh, a fish more, uh, you know, more uh, affordable. But to do that, we'd have to, re, you know, make sure that all the fish, global fish, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, species uh, regenerated. Um, uh, so, um, <clears throat> Uh, yeah, there was also an article in the Lancet. I think I don't know if that's the same article that you know uh, it would be much healthier not to have as much red meat. The other thing is, and I don't know, maybe this is just my hippie self talking. Maybe if you had inexpensive organic fruits and vegetables, you know, if it was as cheap to buy organic fruits and vegetables as it is to buy soda and chips and a burger, then maybe people would start to shift to those. You know, or if it was cheaper to buy fruits and vegetables, you know, people would, would shift to, uh, cause, so, so the whole idea is to look at this as sort of a system and say, okay, why are people eating so many burgers? You know, is it just because 
they like it, you know, they, they like it, but or is it because there's some alternatives that we can offer that will get them away from it? Uh, and at this point, I am trying to stay away from banning things because uh, at this point, I think that politically that's just a real, uh, you know, non-starter. But, you know, maybe eventually people would get to the point and say, yeah, fine, okay, you know. I mean, ideally, I would say, <laughs> Uh, let some of the prairie reestablish itself, you know, in the middle of the country and let the bison herds get it back up to 60 million and then use that as some of your red meat if you have to have red meat, you know, and, and get rid of most of the cattle uh, industry. But, but, we, it, but we sort of have to think creatively on a systemic level to try and, and reorient the entire diet of, of, of the, not just the American public, the, the problem is of the whole global public, although a lot of the planet looks at the United States say, oh, what, what's the United States doing? I'm going to do it. So maybe if the United States changed, you know, the rest of the planet would change. Do you think you could pass the mic just one row up to this gentleman right there? Um, I probably didn't understand it uh, well enough, but you had a slide where where the Green New Deal would provide like a lot of free stuff, like free education and universal health care. I was just wondering, uh, like, w um, where would the money come from to provide these things? Right. Yeah, no, that, that's uh, fine. Yeah, uh, uh, as I sort of went through quickly, you know, how would you pay for it? And I didn't talk about Medicare for all, although Ocasio-Cortez's um, proposal does talk about it. I think that actually, uh, if you provided better food and you had less pollution, the national medical bill would go down and make it easier to do Medicare for all. So Medicare for all would actually uh, profit or benefit from the Green New Deal as much as um, you know the Green New Deal could benefit from Medicare care for all. But to answer your you know uh, the question about free public college, that's not that expensive. I mean, for about a hundred billion a year, <laughs> you can get a you can get a free public college system. I think you can other, get other stuff. But the main thing is, is that, you know, you have to consider this stuff as an investment. And if you do that, and they are investments because they return really good, you know, there's a great return on investment, like, you know, pre-K is a great return on investment. So what you have to do is, you have to sort of have a combination. You have to say, okay, look, a lot of investment money comes from creating it. That's what banks do. So you create some of that money. A lot of it comes from taxing uh, the uh, rich and the uh, uh, most powerful corporations because, well, that's where the money is and we think we have a better idea where to spend it than they do. And, you know, it might sound rather, um, um, uh, you know, arrogant, but, I mean, it's, it, it's up to the society to decide whether it's true or not, whether it's better for uh, a company to get a billion dollars in profits and distribute it, or better to take maybe half of that and throw it into a public education system. So it's sort of up to the, up to the society to decide, you know, um, how much they want to tax the peop the uh, folks that have way too much money. So mu or let's just put it this way: they have so much money, they effectively don't know what to do with it. Uh, and uh, how much money do we want to create? And then. What are our other budget priorities? Do we need a, a military that's you know spending almost a trillion dollars a year? So those are the sorts of things that you know we've been floating along for decades, letting this thing sort of fester. But you know we, we should I think we should make some hard decisions about changing the way that uh, money flows in the society. Do we so have some questions in the back of the room? Yeah, I actually was curious about, you mentioned something about how the train system and you talked about hub and spoke and that reminded me of the aviation industry. Mm -hmm. How would this affect that industry considering that they do leave a pretty big imprint on our economy now and it's growing rapidly? Yeah, um, I understand it's actually aircraft uh, maintenance um, programs here. Is that right? Yeah. So, well, first of all, uh, realize it's going to take like 20 years to make this transformation. Um, High-speed rail now, I've read studies say, makes more sense than planes say, at trips up to 640 miles. So 
And, you know, as, as it improves, it might make more sense uh, e even uh, greater distances. So what I would say is that, again, uh, the advantage of, of planning is you can plan in a very logical, methodical way how to move those people into the new occupations. I mean, a lot of the, um, I'm sure a lot of the skills taking care of a, a plane engine could be applied to a high-speed rail engine. You know, so a lot of this, uh, for instance, with the military, um, my mentor Seymour Melman, he spent a lot of time trying to figure out, okay, if you cut the military budget, what would you do with all those people? Well, his idea was you retrain them, and uh, they come up with a plan of what they were going to do, and you could apply that to all the other industries. You know, you retrain people, you, you could even say you're going to get this particular job here. You, it happens over 20 years so that it's not some, you know, um, helter-skelter chaotic thing. So I think you can very um, methodically move to a different industry without freaking everybody out that they're going to lose their job. There was a question there in the middle. Hello, uh, thank you for your uh, lecture earlier. So I was wondering with initiatives like the Belt and Road Initiative in China, which is putting um, investments into developing countries in order to uh, make trade and uh, to, fill, to basically facilitate trade, um, the, uh, it seems like uh, you advocated that, that the US should do that and promote green policies. And China has some green policies that it has been implementing. It's implementing like an energy sector or energy field with uh, wind farms. But it seems to me that it could be a lot cheaper and easier for them in, to industrialize those developing areas using fossil fuel production and using uh, oil and gas. So, in the sh so trying to uh, frame the conversation more long-term thinking versus that kind of short-term thinking. Um, how can you, like, what, what would you propose in, in order to start, like, a Belt and Road type initiative that involves the Green New Deal here in America? Yeah, uh, well, it would take, um, I think it would take a while to get going. Um, I think uh, it would take, uh, just in general, it's going to take a few years to get the political will to do this, and then it's going to take a few years after that to do all the planning, and then to get the factory started to get going. And then at that point, um, yeah, the Chinese are really, uh, they're actually, you know, uh, using coal plants to run the factories that then, you know, lay the rail for, for that uh, Belt Road, which is sort of a disaster. And so, um, uh, you know, when you're dealing with other countries, you know, you have a limited amount of things you can do, but I'm, you know, hopefully, perhaps, um, the UN could have a role and there could be more of a global uh, discussion of how to, um, to you know, you're, we're going to have to use fossil fuels to at least create the first wind turbines, right? And then once you got those wind turbines, then you can use their electricity to run the factories to then output the, um, you know, rail for the Belt Road. That's the ideal way that you would do it, but um, so, the, the United States could also help with that, but they'd have to get their industrial machinery sectors up and running uh, before that happens. So, uh, I, yeah, you know, th that's definitely um, uh, a, a difficult uh, a situation, and dealing with China and trying to get them to move in the right direction, you know, I, I don't want to mis minimize the problems they have because they have their own internal dynamic as to why that's happening. So. Uh, um, <clears throat> Again, the best I can say is, you know, we're here in the United States, we can get this going in the United States, and then hopefully we can somehow reach out to the rest of the world, particularly China. Great. Right there in the back? Yeah, Professor Ring, uh, you yeah. wanted to challenge you. Yeah. You wanted to keep quiet because of what you said. Uh-huh. You to challenge you. Okay. Because of partisan politics, everything done in this country is based on whether you're Republican or you're Democratic or whatever, whatever party you belong to. We have a president who has no 
political experience, coming up, carrying the environment, environmental training, you know, in front of the whole globe, in the name of America, make America great again. Actually, it's making him great again. So now all these proposals I've heard, they sound fantastic. Oh, but good. Okay. And you are blaming everything on China, which is actually is a victim, not the victimizer. For example, you just quoted the fact that the BRI, one belt, one road. Okay, that's going to benefit the whole world. But then you said they use coal driven thing to build this railroad, which is not true. First of all, in one of your slides, you mentioned that the fastest trains, the high speed railroad, is French. That is not true. <laughs> China already has. A 600 kilometer per hour train, faster than what the French. So your data is actually obsolete. And I just want to mention that if we keep on having this attitude in our country here, we're not going to catch up with China. I guarantee you, because you are casting that country as a foe, where it can do us a lot of good in this country if we cooperate with them, both on environmental issues technological issues, and whatever. I don't know what is getting into the brains of these people to think that we're going to fight a war, we're going to fight a war. We cannot fight a war because that would be the end of mankind. So I'm telling you that I like the lecture, but it's obsolete because of the fact that fundamental reason, because this country is heading in the wrong direction, based entirely on partisan politics, favoring countries like Israel, stuff like that, and to the denigration of everybody else. Yeah. Okay, well, let's let Professor uh, Yeah, on. so um, about the partisan politics. So my way out of that is if you have a program that, re so a lot of what Trump did was he appealed to the working class, partly out of racism, but also partly because he said enough about manufacturing that people got their, you know, antennas came up and they said, oh, he wants to actually help manufacturing. He didn't do any of it, really, uh, but he actually, he, he talked about it. If, if, I don't know how partisan I should be, if, say, the Democratic Party came up with a program like this that was clearly extremely supportive of manufacturing and it was concrete, much more concrete than he is and much more supportive than he is, I have a feeling you'd get a significant chunk of that white working class that went for Trump and, and, and the Republicans. In fact, I think you could get a lot of rural voters because they need a lot of help and they're not getting help now. So they figure, all right, whatever, throw a bomb or whatever, vote for, the, vote for Trump and they've got these, uh, I mean, when, when Roosevelt uh, put through like the Rural Electrification Administration and electrified a lot of rural areas, they voted for the Democrats for a long time. So you can get, I think, uh, I'm hoping, you can pull apart the whole partisan uh, thing which looks like you know it was set in stone, but these things are never set in stone. You can, make, you can create a political realignment by appealing to the material interests of most of the population, and hopefully that would lead to something. Now, and then I stand corrected about uh, the Chinese trains, I'm very happy to uh, be corrected about that. Other questions right there? Maybe. Hello. Um, you had mentioned that all of this has to be sellable to somebody. Uh, do you think that the amount of effort and time it's going to take that to actually get the cultural <laughs> shift to adopt sustainable things because we have such a just consumer disregard culture for it that people tune out when you talk about it. Um, the, do you think that the, the cultural shift should be something that's federally regarded, something that is focused by, or because I understand the, the choice and the word propaganda could get thrown around, but on a more global level, I feel like that's something that's not, uh, I, I don't know. Do you think that it should be something that's federally regarded? Um, well, yeah, so, I mean, there, there are some possible cultural choices going on here, like do people, would people prefer to be in a more walkable neighborhood or would they prefer to stay in a suburb? That's a really intense cultural choice. Would people prefer burgers or 
you know, organic food. That could be another real intense cultural choice. Um, uh, what I'm hoping is that uh, you make things available that, that make them cheaper, you make them even higher quality, uh, more. So let's say, um, again, not to um, disrespect the airline industry, but let's say the high speed rail was more comfortable and easier to use and more enjoyable and cheaper. Well, then you'd be out competing the other industry. Uh, the, if the electricity would, if you say, okay, you're gonna get cheaper electricity, well, I think people would be for that. Um, uh, the manufacturing part, you know, most people don't know anything about where their manufacturing comes from, so you sort of have to more sell that on. You're gonna get a lot of good jobs, and um, I don't know if there's much of a cultural shift there. Certainly cars, you know, you can say, well, we'll make it real easy for you to get an electric car, and it's gonna be cheaper. So even with this consumer culture, uh, and also the, if you actually got manufacturing so it was reusing uh, these goods, they might have to change a little bit. Like the phone might have to get a little bit heavier because to make it more easy to pull apart or something. So that so there would be some, you know, maybe somewhat unpredictable uh, considerations there. But um, that's why I'm sort of emphasizing cheaper better, you know, more convenient, <laughs> I'm trying to hit the, the sort of consumer culture uh, and, you know, see, see where, where it goes. Great, thank you. Other <laughs> questions? Let's come up here. Hi, my name is um, Gerardo Ayaga. I go to school here. And um, so you're out here talking about the Global Green New Deal and you know, I don't really see a new world war coming to us, but more like a world war with nature on us as humans. And I feel like that's what needs to happen to bring a like cosmopolitan look on the whole earth, which is sad. And I don't think that it should have to come to, you know, floods, fires, hurricanes to bring that. Yeah, well, that's the problem because, uh, you know, generally humans, you know, react. Uh, well, civilization has been built on, if you think about it, for thousands of years, governments have managed to get young men to fight in ridiculous wars. And, you know, they it, it took hundreds of years, thousands of years to figure out just the right way to do that, to convince people to do something so incredibly stupid, generally. Um, so, but the, what they haven't been good at, and like for instance, there's a book by Jared Diamond called Collapse. What they haven't been good at is doing that same thing so that they avoid e ecological collapse. Because if this civilization collapses, we will not be the first. Like the Mayan civilization is a good example. So we haven't quite developed the same selling points to make that shift in, for, to, to avoid ecological collapse. And what I'm afraid of is that, you know, by the time we get to two degrees and like, you know, South Florida is underwater or whatever, and people finally really wake up, it might be too late. I, hopefully not, uh, but um, hopefully, you know, some of the impetus for the Green New Deal, I think, came because people saw, hey, look at all these disasters that have happened in the last couple of years. So it's really sort of starting to sink in a little more. Uh, but it's very scary. I, I, I just don't know what. Uh, but another point I want to make is, if you scare people about a green new, about the climate, I think it's very important that you have like a safe refuge. You have a solution, because if you scare people about the climate, like Al Gore once made this comment that, uh, you know, it, you you get people. It, there's a people quickly move from they don't care about the climate and they deny it the climate change, and then they move to, oh, there's nothing you can do about it. So I think part of the reason that happens is because uh, the, you've had all this, uh, to me, ridiculous carbon taxes and stuff like that. Nobody knows what that would do, or it doesn't sound serious. I mean, if we had been bombed at Pearl Harbor and FDR had gotten up and said, what we need now is a tax, everyone would have said, what? You know, I mean, so to have a tax is the main thing, I think, sort of turns people off. So I, I'm hoping that if you have a real alternative, people will actually take it more seriously because they, they can't take it seriously now. It's just too depressing. You know, you can read that book, on Un Un An Inhabitable Planet, and he really doesn't offer a solution, and you just get depressed and 
screw it, I'm just going to want binge on Netflix or something, you know? And so that's why uh, uh, I'm hoping that psychologically it's better to have a real solution. We still have time for a few more questions. Let's go with you in the Dodgers hat, please. Thank you for acknowledging the Dodgers. I appreciate that. Um, my, my thing is just really is the trust issue. The majority of America, when I, I don't want to say it, but there's a big portion of America does not really trust the American government, the yeah. federal yeah. government. Mm -hmm. And yet we're putting a lot of responsibility on that federal government, hoping that we're going to get a fair shake back. Now, I, you use, and, and some of the examples you used were awesome. I thought, like, this, it, it is possible if we all see ourselves as a human race. But when you talk about, like, the Internet and hoping that the federal government will provide it and everything, right there, you're, you're kind of tapping into certain things of uh, privacy issues, things that Americans may say, like, I don't agree with this. How do you sell that? How do you sell that to, for us as Americans, even in middle America, that has a major distrust in the government, how do you sell that to them to make them believe we're here for you? Well, <laughs> that's a really good question. Um, because, like I said, over the last 40 years, you know, it, 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 it's just been constant. You know, the government is bad and the government did not respond. So, yes, we are. We're great. You know, they, they didn't come out with an ad campaign about why the government is good. Um, so, uh, I, <clears throat> I don't know. You sort of uh, got me stumped a little bit uh, because... No, 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 I appreciate that. No, it's just a really good question because, you know, part of the whole uh, selling point of, like, we got to use the federal government is, you know, you got to trust the federal government. And, um, uh, I mean, all I could say is, you, it, may, you know, maybe you have to say, well, look, you know, you're getting your Medicare from us, you're getting your Social Security, you got the interstate highway system, uh, there's all kinds of, you know, got the national parks. Look at all the stuff that people got freaked out about with the shutdown, you know. Uh, there's all these great things happen. Maybe, I mean, I don't like to rely on PR campaigns, but maybe, you know, the federal government really needs, or at least the Democratic Party or our other people, they need to really point out all the great things that the federal government is doing and, and that we're going to concentrate on that. One of the problems that happened on the left, if we want to talk about the left, is that, as I said, the Vietnam War happened, and then the left just completely uh, jettisoned the federal government as as some you know as, as a possible solution to problems. And so, it, we it hasn't just been a problem on the right; it's been a problem on the left, you know. And and they have, and so now they're sort of like the Green New Deal comes out, and they're sort of like, wait a minute, I've spent the last 40 years talking about how horrible the federal government is because, you know, they did this and that and the FBI did that and blah, 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 blah. And now I got to reorient and say the federal government, you know, so it's going to, it's, so I think it's a responsibility on the left. It might be a little bit easier at this point <laughs> to get the left, well, and actually maybe it'd be more difficult, but anyway, uh, to get the left to sort of reorient themselves and say, hey guys, you know, you got to stop this. You're feeding into the right wing thing and let's think of, of something but I mean, the word trust is, I think, is a very important one. It's something I think I have to think about more. You know, I appreciate that. So this next question will be our last one. Let's go to those two over there. Hello. Uh, I was wondering how many of the, or not how many, would the majority of jobs generated by the Green New Deal be transient or permanent? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, it might be a little late to uh, try and get to my um, thing here. But uh, they, they would be permanent. They would definitely be permanent. Uh, that's the whole idea. One of the things I don't like about the job guarantee proposals, I don't know if you've heard any of them, but they tend to think of them as, as transient. You know, just as long, until the economic cycle comes back again, you know, people would have these minimum wage jobs so that they wouldn't like be, you know, uh, go into poverty. 
But the, the, I think the advantage of a Green New Deal is you can create lots of good jobs, by which I mean high skill, well paying, uh, open to advancement, you know, and rather permanent, or at least, you know, uh, full benefits. I mean, real good jobs. So um, uh, there's no reason, you know, that that, that wouldn't happen. And, and, you know, the manufacturing's high skill, the construction skilled, uh, a lot of these things are pretty high skilled. So, yeah, absolutely, that they should be. Um, at least long-term jobs. Okay, well, thank you so much, Dr. Rin, and let's give him another big <laughs> round of applause. <laughs> yeah, thank you for sticking it out, and I really appreciate it. Oh, and by the way, uh, feel free to email me uh, if, if you uh, would like to uh, get in contact with me. Okay. Okay.